Have you ever noticed that um, in life, we sometimes have people we don't like? Anybody here have people you don't like? Oh, come on. All right. Yeah, we all have people that from time to time we come across that we don't like. We also have people sometimes that we strongly don't like, right? Robert's over there saying, yes, me. All right. Not you. I didn't say I don't like you strongly, but yeah. All right. Anyway, uh, but once in a while we get somebody who we strongly don't like, and yet there was something about them, like their accomplishments, um, how they ap- approach life, their, their tenacity, that, that gives you, you, that earns like your respect. Have you ever had that? For, for me, there's a guy I don't like that I have great respect. His name is Bill. Bill Belichick. Anybody know who I'm talking about? If you don't know, here, here's a picture of him. All right, Bill Belichick is, is the head coach of the New England Patriots, right? He is voted by me the number one worst dressed coach in the NFL. <laughs> and, and he's not a really nice guy either. Actually, he's pretty ruthless, and he's not always on the up and up. Like um, a number of years ago in 2007, he got fined a half a million dollars because he videotaped the Jets practices. Yeah. So not, not, not a great guy, but he will do anything to win. And, and the reality is he wins. Do you know in four years, the Patriots won three Super Bowls when he was a coach. He's been the coach for 13 years. And out of those 13 years, 10 years, they have won the AFC East. That's pretty impressive. Five years, they've actually gone to the Super Bowl. One year, they didn't win, lose a game the whole year long. And, and so I may not like him, and I, I might pray that my son does not grow up like this, this guy who is shrewd and a cutthroat coach, but I have some pretty major respect for what he's done. Well, this morning, I know it's July. It's not even close to football season, um, although I wish it was. Uh, but I bring this up about an NFL coach because, well, it kind of relates to this parable that we're going to be looking at today. We're in the middle of a series called Parables. It's a series where we're taking a look at the parables of Jesus. Now, parable is, is a certain, simple earthly story with a spiritual meaning. It's a real-life story that helps us to see a deeper, more spiritual kind of uh, uh, truth. And so what we find out is that Jesus, as we go through the Gospels, we see Jesus understands that many of us learn best in story. That while we're listening to a story, all of a sudden something comes into view and all, like the light bulb goes on and we see this truth in, in a more vivid kind of real life kind of thing. And, and so he shares these stories, these parables to paint pictures for us of the kingdom of God, of our relationship with God, paint pictures of how we are to be as followers of Jesus. And so today we're going to look at a very unusual story, actually one of the least known stories. It's, it's the parable of the shrewd manager. And so if you've got a Bible, pull it out. Turn with me to Luke chapter 16. That's where we'll be. Uh, if you've got a smartphone, you can head to the website on the screen where you can follow along. You can take notes. You can do all kinds of stuff there. In fact, at the end, we love for some of your feedback um, at the end there, okay? All right. So first off, we have to understand that this is one of those parables that is, me- that is oftentimes misunderstood. A lot of times it's distorted. And quite frankly, it's because it's one of the more confusing um, sections of Scripture to really wrap your mind around. And therefore, many churches just skip over it, but not us. We're going to dive in today, okay? You ready? All right, first off, you also need to know what shrewd is. Anybody know what shrewd is? Yeah, all right, good. You see it on your U version. Excellent job. All right. In the dictionary, shrewd says that it is having or showing sharp powers of judgment. It has a number of words sitting underneath it, like mischievous and hard-headed. And so this story is about a manager who is passionate, is uh, tenacious about what he's doing, just like Bill Belichick is 
tenacious, all right? And, and, and yet, it, you're soon going to see that it's not like he is intense about winning a game. He's not even intense about becoming a manager. He's just intense about surviving in life. <laughs> Verse 1, Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. Now, I don't know if you saw this, but chapter 15 is where we were a couple weeks ago. We started a series off with one of the more popular parables, the parable of the prodigal, the wasteful son. This starts off with the parable of the wasteful manager. Okay, but there are two different stories with two totally different meanings. That other one was all about how then the son comes back and gets grace and the father accepts him and loves him and takes him in. And this one is not about a manager getting fired and getting his job back. No, this parable is, is about what that manager, that guy does when he is caught sleeping and slacking at work. Verse 2. So the boss called him in and asked him, what is this that I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, uh-oh, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I am not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. And so Jesus is telling the story to this first audience. In that day, they would understand that when he talks about this boss, this rich man, this rich man was probably a guy who owned a whole bunch of land. And he used that land, and he, he, he rented it out to a number of tenants who would then farm those sections of that land to make a living. And, and then he would hire a manager who would come in, and he would collect a portion or a tax or, or a percentage off of the land, the stuff that that would grew off the land as a way of rent. Well, this manager, he wasn't doing a very good job. Actually, he stunk at his job. And they were losing money over this whole idea. The money was not coming in like it was. And so the, the master, he fired him. He fired him because he was slacking. Now, in that day, there weren't the help wanted ads. There wasn't monster.com. Uh, there were limits to the job op options that were out there. And if you were a manager, there were probably not a whole lot of masters there, and they probably were pretty in interconnected, if you know what I mean. And, and so it would be hard for him to find another managing job when he just got fired by that master down the road for slacking. And so he was trying to figure out what he was going to do because he didn't have the gifts, or should I say the back, to dig or to build walls. And he was going to be too proud to go around begging for money or for some help. And so he says to himself in verse 4, I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. And so he called in each of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe the master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. So this guy's back is against the wall. I mean, he's about to be jobless, and that might mean he's about to be homeless, and he had only one play to make, and that was to get, to get to the tenants before the master did. And when he got to the tenants, he, he struck a deal with them. Now, there's all kinds of debate on this section of Scripture and trying to say, you know, oh, you know he probably just uh, you know, took the d discounted price out of what he would get out of commission. Or, or maybe it, it was that the master was evil and not legal or something like that, and so he was just taking out the illegal tax or something. Most probably, he was ripping his master off even more. Most probably. But he did it so that those people would be indebted to him. He did it so that if, actually when, which is going to be in like a day or two, he needed some help, he could go to somebody and, and they were going to be willing to help him out because they were indebted to him. I mean, it's quite crafty and ingenious. 
mischievous, but brilliant. <laughs> so what do you think the master, how the master responded? Let's look at verse 8. The master then commended the dishonest manager because he acted so shrewdly. It says the master wasn't ticked. The master was impressed. Now, now again, I've heard people try to explain this away, that somehow this manager made this master out to be, you know, a, a good guy and somehow helped him save face or something like that. But I don't think that's the case if Jesus says he was a dishonest manager. Now, I think he was just impressed with what he did when his back was against the wall. See, before we, we misinterpret this, please understand that this is, Jesus isn't trying to say that it's okay to be immoral in certain places for a good moral reason. Because this, this story isn't about morality. This story is completely and totally about why this manager, this manager who, whose back was against the wall, got the respect of the master got this respect of this master even though he squandered off more of his money and lost the guy even more money. And it was because he was so ruthless. He was so, he, he had decided quickly and decisively and distinctly exactly what he was going to do, and he went for it and he did it. It was because he was shrewd, because he was passionate, because he was intense, and the decisions he made. And I can only imagine that this master was impressed with, with how he worked through that process when his back was against the wall. He had no other option. And he probably thought to himself, gosh, I wish this guy worked so masterfully and so incredibly when he was my manager. But then Jesus gets to this point of the story, the second part of verse 8. Jesus says, For the people of this world, of this world, are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. Hmm. Well, first off, in verse 1, we know that the intended audience for the story was the disciples. And, and yet most scholars agree that when you hear the word disciple in, um, in Luke, it's not necessarily just the 12 disciples. Luke, other, which is different than a lot of the other gospel writers, Luke uses that word a lot more generously. So it probably included a lot of followers of Jesus. It probably included all these people that had already heard these stories like the parable of the prodigal son. All right? So, so most likely... Jesus was sharing this story and saying it in a unique, kind of tongue-in-cheek kind of way to his followers of Jesus and saying, if only, if only people of light, if only Christians, if only followers of Jesus, if only you were as, as eager and ingenious in your attempt to follow me and in your attempt to, to share the grace that you found in me. If only you would do that like the rest of the world does as they're trying to climb the corporate ladder or get money or get power or get safety or get comfort. If only you did that, you would be radically different. And the world around you would be radically different. If only. And so Jesus uses this cutthroat, dishonest, mischievous manager as example of this passion that he wants us to have as followers of Jesus. And he wants us to have that same kind of intensity and tenacity in our discipleship toward him and our sharing with Jesus, the same kind of tenacity and passion that you see in a player or a coach who will do whatever it takes to win the game, or the same kind of passion and intensity that you see in a businessman who will do whatever it takes to land the deal. But here's the problem. Jesus looked at his followers at that time, and he looks at you and me. 
And he says, you guys lack shrewdness. See, I, I, I'm certain 2,000 years ago they needed to hear this message because they needed to be prepared for what was, uh, what was to come. And, and probably it was because, you know, I don't know, in, in, a, in a short period of time, all of a sudden, they as followers of Jesus were going to face persecution for being faithful to God. And so they needed to be ready for that. They needed to, to be able to step up to the plate. But I am confident that if Jesus was here today in this community, in this society, in this day and age, he would share the same story. And it's not because of persecution. And sure, there are arenas where we get persecuted for our faith to some degree. But it's because we're slackers. Because we're okay being called Christians when, when it's easy. We're okay being kind of comfortably numb Christians. We're, we know being a Christian and going to church is good for us. And, and we're good with it as long as being people of light isn't too inconvenient for us. You know what I mean? And so we end up being people that are definitely not shrewd, but people that are pretty apathetic. If you've been coming for, here for any amount of time, you know that I'm pretty passionate about football, and, and my team is the... Somebody said something that means I don't like you over there. All right, you good. <laughs> I'm very passionate about Bears, but what you probably don't know is I grew up a baseball fan, all right? And and in 40 years, I've lived in a number of different places, but I spent some significant time in Chicago, St. Louis, and Houston. If you know anything about baseball, that means those were three cities that for many years had three different professional teams that duked it out. They were in the same division. They were same, uh, they were going against each other and battling for it, okay? So when I was a little kid, I, I would watch WGN, I would get my AM radio, I would listen to the Cubby games as much as I could because I am a Cubby fan. Do we have any Cubby fans here? All right, good, yes. You don't even have to be from Chicago to be a Cubby fan. It's like an international kind of thing, and I have no clue why because we don't win. 104 years and counting, you know? Uh, so anyway, uh, but then we moved to St. Louis, and it is amazing. Do you know that the nightly news spends like half of their time talking about the Cardinals? Even in January. They like mention the Rams in passing, and then they talk about the Cardinals. It is insane. You cannot live in St. Louis and not be a Cardinals fan unless you're a Cub fan, Right? Which, by the way, I just got to throw this out there. Um, <clears throat> the Cubs won yesterday against the Cardinals. Yes. Yeah, some of you guys know about that. All right. Anyway, then you moved to Houston. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody an Astro fan? I'm sorry. All right. All right. Um, in, in Houston, the... the we, we treat the Astros kind of like we treat our travelers. You know what I mean? We have a team. We're excited about the team. We'll go watch a game or two. And our favorite player is, I don't know. I don't know any of the names. You know what I mean? I, I mean, they're, they're, they are not great fans in Houston. In fact, if you go to Minute Maid Park, most of the time it's half empty. And if you watch the news, you might get the score scrolling along on the bottom. I mean, it is, except for a few exceptions, Astro fans are lame and apathetic. Now, I know somebody from, from Houston is going to watch that on the video and they're going to be calling me. Sorry about that. Unfortunately, Christ followers are much more Astro fans than Cardinal or Cub fans. They are. And what Jesus is trying to say here is that he doesn't want apathetic 
followers. He wants shrewd, passionate followers. He says, look at the world around you. I mean, look at how people are so excited about the Razorbacks. Or they're so excited about the life that they're living or the career path that they're on. Why can't you be like that? You are people of light. Start looking like it. Start showing some passion. You know, it's kind of interesting that he uses that title to describe us here, the people of light. He doesn't use that title all that often. But, but when he does, he, he shares it in a way, in a context of helping us to see that we are people that because of what we have, we can change the world. We can light up this world that is full of darkness and despair. We have something that changes everything. And when you experience that, when you know that, how can it not totally change you? How can it not totally just overwhelm you because it changes everything in your life and in mine. And it can change everything for the people we pass every single day. We have Christ's grace. Have you ever thought about that gift that we have in Christ's grace, what that looks like. So we just came back from vacation. On Friday, we were driving from northern Arkansas, and we're we're coming through on some back roads, and all of a sudden we find out, hey, we're crossing a dam. It was the Greer's Ferry Dam. That's pretty cool. That is huge. You know, as you go over it, you're like, wow. And as we're going over it, it reminded me of this illustration that I heard one time about the grace of Jesus Christ. This guy talks about imagining standing at the the foot of the Hoover Dam. And and you're a couple hundred yards from the foot of the Hoover Dam. You're looking up, and it looks like it goes forever up there. And then all of a sudden, the dam breaks. And this wall of thundering water comes towards you to crush you and wash you away. And yet, right before it gets to you, the the ground opens up and swallows it up. So that's like Christ's grace. We stand and we face this huge consequence of the things that we've done in our lives. And what we deserve is this huge consequence to just totally obliviate us. We don't have a chance in the world. But Christ stands in the way. And he takes that punishment upon himself as he goes to the brutal cross. As he hangs there, as he takes his one last breath, as he says, it is finished. It is done. And what we deserved, what we deserve for the things we've done and the things we do right now, we don't get. Jesus gets it. But what we don't deserve, that's exactly what Jesus grants us. Pardon and peace, grace and forgiveness. And when you receive a gift like that, when you you have a near-death experience, a near-spiritual death experience, when you have a message like that, how can you just say, oh, thanks, and go on? I mean, how can you do that? It's not like then it gives us this little name that really doesn't mean anything like, By the way, I was born in Ohio, so I'm a Buckeye. Um, I I play guitar, so I'm a guitarist. And I know Jesus, so I'm a Christian. No. It's not like that. Right. (laughs) No, it changes everything. I mean, it, it warrants everything. It takes over everything. 
I mean, this is not some little nice-to-know self-help kind of thing. No, this is a life-changing, eternity-transforming, a value and priority-flipping kind of event. It changes everything. And so how can we be apathetic about that? And how can we not be passionate and shrewd and intense about sharing that? Jesus goes a little bit farther. In the next verse, he he talks about something that you and I, even as, as people of light, even as followers of Jesus, we can get passionate and tenacious about, and that's money. Verse 9, he says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. He's saying, you know, it's good to be shrewd with that stuff. Just make sure you're shrewd with it in the right way. Okay? Make sure you're not shrewd in a way that is a waste. But then he goes on a little bit further, and he starts almost to cloud the water in a second. So we'll get back there in a second. But he says this in verse 13. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, this is coming clear real quick. But quickly, when we start hearing money, all of a sudden we go there. This parable has nothing to do with money. This parable has nothing to do with dishonesty. Doesn't have anything to do with dishonest stewardship. This parable has everything to do with our discipleship, our commitment, our following Jesus. It has everything to do with following Jesus with our whole life. See, Jesus wants our lifestyle to be committed to him. He he wants to impact the decisions we make the things we do, the values we have, the priorities in our life. He wants to have all of that. All of that should be impacted by our relationship with this one who just stepped in the way of this mountainous sea that was coming at us to crush us and who saved us. He wants our passion. go a little farther in Luke 18, all of a sudden you get across to this rich young man, this rich ruler. And he tells the rich ruler what? Does anybody know? Sell everything. Why? You go back to Luke 9, and it talks about following Jesus and the cost of following Jesus. And he tells somebody uh, whose father just died, what? Don't go back. Somebody who wants to say goodbye to mom and dad, what? Don't go back. So is Jesus saying that that in order to be saved, we have to disown our family and we need to be poor? No. He's not saying that at all. But what he is saying is that when we experience the grace of Jesus Christ, when we experience the fact that he has stood in the way of the penalty that we deserve, it changes everything. It means we have this relationship with the Savior of the world, and he becomes number one. He becomes number one in, in everything that we do, in everything that we are. And, and so if we have to choose... We choose him. And so he has our passion. He has our intensity. And so just as you are passionate about um, finding love, or as just as you're passionate about having a family and growing that family, just as you're passionate about your, your career level or your career ladder, or just as you're passionate about uh, saving for retirement or building a legacy, all the more you should be passionate about sharing who Jesus Christ is and sharing this Christ that you have experienced from Jesus Christ. Let's look at one more verse. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. 
In Matthew chapter 10, um, Jesus is sending the 12 disciples out for the very first time. And in the midst of that, he shares one verse that I want to share with you. Verse 16. Jesus says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. And we can kind of get that. But then what he says right after this kind of brings everything else in clear. Therefore, be shrewd as snakes, yet innocent as doves. So I was talking to somebody out in the comments who was telling, talking to somebody coming in to worship, and they were saying um, about being dishonest to some degree, and he goes, well, pastor said I could do that. (laughs) Shrewd as snakes, innocent as doves. That's our job. So how? How are you going to be shrewd as snakes, as passionate and tenacious, tenacious, whatever the word is, as, as Bill Belichick is to win the game? How are you going to be like that to share Jesus Christ? How? How are you going to use the things that God has given you in, in a way to point other people to the one that has changed you? How are you going to be a person, and how are we going to be a church that is shrewd in how we, we so passionately want the rest of this community to know about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ? I'm sure it'll take us out of our comfort zone. I'm sure for, for some of us, it's going to mean that we might radically need to change things in our lives, priorities, or who knows what God will ask us. But it's worth it. Because if you look at the world around us, if you put on the news, if you see the people in your lives, gosh, I just got an email this morning. You see that there is a world around that is full of darkness, full of despair, who desperately needs us as people of light to shine. They need to know who Jesus is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you that you have pursued us through your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you for the amazing grace that you have poured over us. Lord, I confess, I confess for myself and I confess for the people in this room that so often we become numb Christians, that so often we get numb to the grace that you have poured over us and we take it for granted. Lord, I pray that you would help us to become tenacious, that you would help us to become shrewd as we go out into this world and we try to make a difference and help them see what we have seen and what we have experienced in you, Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would help us, that you would open our eyes and wake us up in a way that would be contagious, in a way that that you would be known to the people around. In Jesus we pray. Amen.